Okay, thank you for having me today. Um, so I am also the current chair of the Queensland branch of the Australian Rehabilitation Providers Association. So I've been asked to come and speak around um, time off work following injury and some of the factors that can affect an injured worker's time off work, as well as how to best prepare for them coming back to work and making that effective. So I thought I'd break it down into three sort of sections to talk about this morning. Um, first was around the individual and organisational influences of time off work from injury. Um, then looking at how time off work actually impacts on both the individual and the organisation. And then finishing up with how we plan for return to work from injury and mainly looking at the employer's role. So how we manage perceptions um, and personal characteristics to ensure a successful return to work outcome. So I thought I'd start with some stats. You may have all seen similar stats before around injury. Um, but this was a study that was actually done in the UK. Um, it was the Cardiff Health Experience Survey. And what they did was they asked participants, there were only around 100 participants, but they asked them to rank the barriers to return to work from injury. Um, and what participants actually did was they placed um, their impairment as actually the lowest rank in terms of their barrier to return to work. So what they actually did was showed that things like psychological or cognitive barriers, issues in the workplace, social issues, actually rank higher in terms of being a barrier to getting someone back to work than the actual impairment from their condition. So this just sets up a little bit of information around why I'm focusing so strongly on individual and organisational factors um, influencing time off work is because they can be quite significant in terms of how long someone has off work and when they come back to work. Okay. So in terms of the influences of time off work, the length of time away from work is most influenced by perceptions of the injured worker. So this might be the injured worker's perceptions about their injury, about recovery times, about workplace support, um, and also about the return to work options available. So it's important to note that perceptions are not necessarily fact, but they're fact to the individual. So we might try to offer a lot of workplace supports, but depending on the individual's perceptions around those other things, their injury, their recovery times, whether things are going to plan, that can actually influence how they perceive the level of support they're receiving. The other thing that's quite influential in terms of length of time away from work is the relationship between the worker and the employer. So you may have heard a lot of um, research around the supervisor's role in terms of return to work. The reason we do so much research around that is because it is so important. It is such a significant relationship as far as getting someone back to work. Um, and that's in addition to their personal factors. So these could be, you know, their age, the type of injury you have. Gender can be quite important, um, particularly in certain industries, depending on stereotypes around how certain gender should respond to injury in industries. So that can be important as well. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the employer-worker relationship. Um, and I'd like to give a bit of an example from my own experience as a rehab provider on a couple of cases that I've been involved in and how that relationship between employer and worker has actually influenced the person's time off of work. So I've been fortunate enough to work with quite a large civil construction company that's a national company. Um, and I've had two workers from them, more than two, but I'll use two as an example. So worker A, he um, injured his shoulder while at work. So I'm not sure of the specific um, condition. I didn't have to worry about that. I just had to worry about getting him back to work. But he did have to have surgery as a result of it. So he had an initial six weeks off after injuring his shoulder at work. Um, his job involves him using a lot of above head movements. So quite shoulder specific. So he then had some surgery. There were suitable duties that had been identified in those initial six weeks off that he could have done pre-surgery, but he continued to cite pain during that period and put up barriers to actually going on suitable duties pre-surgery. So he then has the surgery. There's a typical recovery period of six to 12 weeks, but usually around the six week mark, we get permission from the doctor to look at 
suitable duties. So that did happen. The employer were really great. They identified some suitable duties for this individual um, and he did commence them. However, he wasn't able to upgrade as quickly as was expected by both the doctor and the employer. So the employer kept sort of pushing him and asking him, what's going on? Why aren't you, you know, getting up to, to sort of spec as far as your full duties go? He was reporting pain, but he also um, was talking to us as the rehab provider around feeling like he wasn't understood in the workplace, feeling that his manager and particularly his colleagues as well, didn't quite understand the extent of his injury and just expected it to go to plan, expected that because the doctor said he would be able to upgrade his duties, that it should happen in the time frame that the doctor said. Unfortunately, the employer after about three months wanted to find out why perhaps he hadn't um, returned as quickly as was expected and they'd heard some rumblings about his personal life and the behaviours that he was um, undertaking in his personal life, some of the activities that he might have been doing on the weekends. So they actually launched a bit of an investigation into him and his personal life, which he did find out about. So from that point, pretty much that relationship degraded. There was no communication between worker and employer. He ceased his suitable duties with them um, which obviously they have some rights there, but basically it's now been 18 months from what was a fairly simple shoulder injury and surgery, and he's still not at work. You know, so there's that example of that breakdown in relationship and support. Another example, same company, similar situation, worker B, I'll call him. He actually um, passed out at work. There's no real explanation why, but he passed out, hit his head and unfortunately suffered a traumatic brain injury as a result. It was quite mild, um, had six weeks off, so similar sort of time frame, doctor's orders. However, he actually maintained communication with his management team over that time and they maintained communication with him. They kept him up to date with the projects that he was involved in pre-injury um, within reason, but just kind of made him feel like he was still a part of the workplace and still involved. When time came that the doctor said, yes, let's explore suitable duties, um, the management team actually involved him in that process, sat down with him and went, this is what your job is. These are the projects that you're working on. You know, do you think there's anything in these aspects that you can do currently? And together they worked with him on identifying those suitable duties. His recovery has been slow and slower than expected, but he stayed at work over the time. And again, we're around the same sort of period, 18 months, which if you know much about traumatic brain injuries, you can be up to two years before someone's, you know, sort of resolved any new symptoms from them. Um, but he's at work. And basically what's happened is he's been proactive in identifying his upgrades as well and saying to his managers, yes, I think I can add these things to it. And in terms of his experience, he's reporting that he feels very supported in the workplace, he feels, even though they may not fully understand his injury, it is quite a unique one, that they're at least trying and that they're trying to get him back to work in a, a caring and supportive way. So I just wanted to highlight those two examples because it's quite important in terms of um, maximising the worker's return to work, in terms of the two different treatments of worker A and worker B. In terms of the length of time away from work, you know, as we said, they're most influenced about those perceptions um, and workers who do return to work early or before they're fully recovered generally find that work assists them with their overall recovery. And that was the experience with worker B because he did get back into the workplace environment. He experienced a whole um, suite of benefits from being back at work. So not just that support from management, but also feeling a sense of purpose. He wasn't sitting at home all day sort of falling into a victim role and feeling sorry for himself, he was at work trying and that can be quite powerful. So in terms of maximizing the benefits of return to work, we do need workers to feel both physically and emotionally ready and that was perhaps the difference with worker A was he himself was reporting that he wasn't ready. And yes, we can't always go on that when the doctor's saying that we should get them back to work and we know that getting them back to work is good for them. But 
perhaps more inclusion in the return to work process and more um, sort of trial and error as far as his suitable duties might have seen a different result there in terms of involving him on that physical and emotional level. The other things are health literacy, as we said, the relationship with the employer, but also the involvement in identifying return to work duties. So that was really the key difference between worker A and worker B that I've been involved in, was that relationship as well as how involved they were in their suitable duties or their return to work duties. You know, worker A did not have a lot of control over the duties he was coming back to. Worker B was very proactive, but she was, or he was proactive because he had that relationship with the employer where he felt like he could say, hey, I don't think that duty is actually very suitable for me, but how about I try this one? And so there was a bit of negotiation there on both parts. Okay, sorry. So in terms of moving on to organisational influence of time off work, we really know that the overarching culture of the organisation is important in how an individual perceives their support. So in terms of the attitudes that the organisation may have around return to work programs, injury and illness, and I know from the pre-forum survey that most people in the room said that their companies have some kind of support program in place to assist with um, injured or ill workers. Um, and I think that was around 60 to 70 percent of people have that, which is brilliant. And that's sort of half the battle in terms of forming a positive culture around return to work. If staff know what supports are in place, they feel more supportive and more able to put their hand up when they are injured and say, I think I would like to try a return to work. What do we have available that can help me? If they're not sure what's available or there have been rumblings you know, within their teams that it doesn't matter that we have these things, no one uses them, then they're less likely to speak up or less likely to cooperate when options are placed on the table. The important thing that I'd like to point out about culture is it's not actually about the visible things that you have in place. So it's not actually about the fact that you do have support systems in place um, you might have an EAP program or you might have a list of suitable duties for every role in your company if someone gets injured. That's not the part of culture that matters. The part of culture is the filtered down effect. What do managers, supervisors, team leaders, employees understand about what happens if they're injured or ill? Because you can have all the programs in the world available to someone, but if they've been told or they feel that using those would be a disadvantage to them, they're not going to use them. So it's all about the messages that are being filtered down. Have them available, but also have people visibly using them and positive outcomes as a result of them. It changes people's attitudes. So in terms of the factors which influence culture, particularly as they relate to return to work, um, we have the management attitudes towards injury and return to work. Um, a lot of the organisational research will say that organisational culture is built top down, so from management down. It does filter up as well. You can imagine if you have employees who are perhaps a little bit um, dissatisfied in their job, that they can breed negativity and negative attitudes. But generally, if managers are on board with positive schemes and they're utilising those schemes when they need them or encouraging staff to utilise them when they need them, that filters out and that breeds a positive culture. So particularly when we're talking about return to work, if managers are more educated in terms of suitable duties, in terms of negotiating with the injured worker, um, in terms of maintaining communication with the injured worker, then they're more able to foster that at their levels below, the team leaders below. The other thing is previous experiences with injury and return to work. Obviously someone who's been through it is more understanding than someone who perhaps has not had a personal experience with it. But I've also found in my experience that someone who has experience can actually have a negative impact on return to work because of the expectations they might have about the individual's injury. <coughs> so it's really important to take a supportive approach rather than a, well in my experience you can just get on with it because that's what I did. 
You know, one size doesn't fit all in injury. And it's about education. As we said, employee involvement in injury and return to work processes. So rather than having suitable duties available and saying here, this is what you're going to do when you come back to work, having a dialogue about it. You know, there may not be options, which is fine, but at least if you're open to it and you give the employee some control over those initial suitable duties, you then open yourself up for more um, leeway to negotiate the duties that you need them to be performing as well. It's a two-way street there. Um, education on injury and return to work, and this is not just waiting for an injury or an illness to occur. This is ensuring that people understand um, what the processes are around injury and illness in the workplace. Just because you talk about injury and illness doesn't mean you're going to get a wave of people getting injured or ill. You know, so particularly in um, I guess more masculine industries, we have a tendency to focus on musculoskeletal injuries, physical injuries, um, you know, aches and pains. And we don't focus so much on the psychological side, the mental health side, but it is quite important, particularly if there's any shift work involved or fly in, fly out work. We do know that that impacts on um, workers' mental health. So talking about and educating them on what's available to them early is about prevention of injury, but it also creates that supportive environment that if something does happen, they're more likely to put their hand up. Because we do know, and I'm not wanting to stereotype, but men are particularly bad at saying, I'm not feeling myself at the moment. No, and particularly if they're in a very blokey environment, they're going to be more concerned about that. So the education on injury and particularly return to work will help with um, facilitating someone putting their hand up early. The earlier we get them, the quicker we get them back to work or we keep them at work. Um, and then the other thing is ensuring that supervisors, team leaders at all levels have that knowledge and understanding of injury and return to work. So they know what is available if someone in their team is injured. All of these things breed a positive return to work culture um, and that's really about minimising that time off for the injured worker and getting benefits for both organisation and individual. So I'll just give one more little bit of information around why I'm talking so much about time off work um, and that's really because the longer someone is off work the less likely they are to come back to work. Okay, so we know three months, the chance of them returning to work drops down to 50%. So we really want to get them in that initial period. Four to six weeks is great. You know, that's sort of the ideal time, soon as better. And you know, obviously we don't want lost time injuries. We want people to come back to work as soon as possible. But if we can get them in that first four weeks, then we're going to increase their chances of a successful outcome and less likely of falling into one of these categories where they may never get back to work. So in terms of the impact of time off, the reason why it does or the probability of coming back to work reduces with time is partially because of the impact it has on the individual. So in terms of the individual's impact, time of work can lead to poorer physical health, so their physical symptoms can degrade over that time poorer mental health, so they may have started with a what seemed like a simple shoulder injury. But the longer they have time off work, the more perhaps depressed they have or the more they start to experience negative feelings about their injury, they start to question, why am I not back at work? Why am I not feeling better? And those perceptions trigger perhaps an adjustment disorder then we've got two conditions on our hand that we're trying to deal with and two conditions is harder to deal with than one. And it's harder to get someone back to work after that. We also have the impact that it has on medical bills, you know, longer period of time off work. Perhaps the more often they're going to the doctor trying to find out why they're experiencing the symptoms they have, the more we're wanting to send them for independent reviews and assessments to find out what's going on and try and get them back. Um, so that can be, you know, an impact on them. And also poorer social integration. So it starts to impact on friendships, family. If work was a big social outlet for an individual, being off of work takes all of those friendships away. 
Now, particularly if people don't know whether they should be talking to the person, they don't know if they're gonna you know, help them by talking to them or make it worse because they're not really sure what's going on with the individual. If you cut them off from that social outlet, they end up isolated. And isolation is quite significant in terms of poorer mental health. As our time off work increases, obviously the impact on the individual also increases and it becomes this vicious cycle. So the more of an impact on the individual, the longer they stay off of work. The longer they stay off of work, the more of an impact it has on them. So it's one of those cycles we want to cut it off as quickly as possible, um, but we obviously need to have you know, quite good supports in place beforehand. In terms of organisational implications of increased time off of work, so you can imagine it obviously impacts on overall claim costs and durations. Um, but it's also about productivity, you know, a loss of a worker, how do you replace that worker for the time that they're off work? When do you start preparing for them not coming back to work? You know, what are those questions there? How does them being not at work impact on their colleagues and the performance of the team that they're working in? You know, so it can be reduced productivity. It can be increased risk to other workers. If there's a team that's always been quite a close team, relied on every individual in that team to do their part, and someone's off of work, how does the work get distributed to those other workers? Are we potentially at risk of overloading them? Do they have to do additional duties to try and make up for the fact that they're one man down? Um, there's also potential costs in terms of replacing the injured worker if it comes to that so either that's temporarily or permanently, a lot of organisations are able to bring in you know, a contract person or a temp for time being while someone's off of work. But if unfortunately the decision gets made that that person's not able to come back to work with your organisation, there's then a cost to replacing them. And the costs in terms of recruitment and retraining of new staff can be three times more than the cost of actually keeping that staff on and putting provisions in place to make them safe at returning to work. There's also the loss of skill and experience. So particularly if someone's been with the company for a longer period of time, they know the ins and outs and they're quite aware of how things operate and they've been a bit of a mentor to other staff, you're losing that as well if the person's not at work. So thinking about these things as well in terms of when I'm bringing the worker back to work, how can I utilise their skills and experience in a suitable duties capacity? Might they be able to help with training staff while they're temporarily incapacitated? Might that be an appropriate um, use of their skill and experience that then reduces the issues with these other factors? Okay. So in terms of preparing for return to work, I've mostly talked a lot about that impact between the individual and the employer in terms of the perceptions around employer support and how that might impact on time off of work. So when we do want to bring someone back to work, what do we do to make that as effective as possible? One of the ways is we want to manage perceptions. So these are the perceptions of the individual, but also the perceptions of their supervisor and their co-workers. What are the expectations that people have of the injured worker when they come back to work? Do they think that they're just going to be better and they're going to be able to be up to scratch with what they used to do? Or do they understand that there's going to be an adjustment period there and there will need to be um, supports put in place to ensure that they're safely returned back to work? How do we manage those perceptions? How do we manage the expectations that um, a particularly male dominant environment might have that um, individual A should have just got on with it and come back to work? You know, do we give education to help and manage those perceptions? The other thing is managing the perceptions of the individual. By maintaining communication with the worker, so the third point there, we can help to manage perceptions that the individual might have around workplace and workplace supports. So that might be by having a direct supervisor, just keep in touch every week or every fortnight, see how the person's going where appropriate. You know, it might be by encouraging 
colleagues, if they're friendly with the individual, to stay in touch with them and just let them know what's going on in the workplace because then you're better able to answer questions from the worker as they come up. They don't sit and dwell on them. They don't start to form these perceptions or these expectations that the workplace is out to get them. The other thing is by being aware of personal factors. So if you know your staff well, generally you know what's going on in their life outside of their injury. So you might know the impact that it has on the worker, particularly if they're married with children. You know, being off of work can't be healthy for a family relationship either. You know, there's reduced income, but there's also change of roles. You know, if the individual is used to going to work and providing for their family, and they're now sitting at home, how does that change how they feel? And is there something you can do to help with that? I'm not saying get involved in their family life, but I'm saying be aware of, can you sort of replace some of that um, loss that they might be experiencing through workplace supports? And as I said, finding creative ways to get them involved in the workplace, even though they may have restrictions. You know, can they be mentoring people while they're away? Can they be a point of contact for someone while they're away? And that might replace those factors. And the other thing is early intervention. So act as soon as possible post-injury. So as I said, we want to get in before we've hit that point where we've got a 50% chance of getting the person back to work. So as soon as possible, we want to be involved. The injury happens. We want to know what the work is going through and how, you know, how they're responding to that injury. What are the general timeframes for them coming back to work, but also how do they feel about that? I know that it can be hard to talk to someone about how they feel about their injury, um, but it is a really important part of them coming back to work. You know, if they feel fine about the injury, they 100% trust the doctors, they think everything's going to go smoothly and they're very positive about it, then yes, you generally see better results. But if they're scared about, say, having surgery, you know, they're going to need some support there. Perhaps someone saying, well, what does your doctor say? Asking them some questions about what the prognosis is or what the risks are of the surgery and getting them thinking more rationally about their injury. And that's something that say a co-worker might want to do or a supervisor might want to do just so that they're understanding the injury better and they're being educated around what the work is going through. You don't have to jump straight into, um, well, we can have you do this, this and this when you come back to work, but it's always good to remind the worker that there will be options when they're ready to come back to work, when they're medically able to come back to work, that there are options for them and that you'll negotiate with them around what that looks like and involve them in the process. If we start planting that seed as early as possible, we start planting the seed of support. Yeah, and that drives a worker to feel like they want to come back to work. Okay. So in terms of managing perceptions, I just wanted to raise a couple of the common, I guess, perceptions that influence work incapacity. Um, and these go hand in hand with that, the longer the person's off of work, um, the more likely they are to experience some of these things. So in terms of like low self-efficacy or low confidence, it's something I come across quite a bit where someone has always been the capable worker. They've always worked to their best. They've always, you know, provided for their family. They've always done everything, you know, above and beyond um, expectations. And now they're injured and they don't know what to do with themselves. It's thrown their world into chaos. They don't have control over when they're going to get better. That's in the hands of the doctors. They don't have control over um, coming back to work. They feel like that's in the hands of their employer. So what starts to happen is their self-confidence, their confidence in their own abilities starts to reduce. And often I see with that an increase in things like pain reporting and incapacity. So that goes to the catastrophizing, sort of the end of the world. You know, if I can't do my job anymore, I'm never going to be able to do anything. I'm not going to be able to support my family and start to get these really broad and big generalizations about incapacity happening. And they may seem really silly to all of us, like when you hear them, 
but to the worker they're very real and they're very complex and the more that we try to manage those perceptions and keep them thinking rationally and talking to the people that do have the information and the expertise, the more we can reduce these things. Dissatisfaction at work can also lead to a perception of incapacity. Um, that generally comes from not having a great relationship either with colleagues or supervisors pre-injury. And so it is why I stress the culture side of things so much um, and also the blaming of work. You know, accidents happen, we all know that. We can put as many preventative measures in place and unfortunately accidents happen from time to time. When you have a worker who is already dissatisfied in their job, they're not feeling the level of support that they perhaps feel that they should, they start to blame the work and they start to say it's work's fault. They should have done this. They should have done that. And then we get that degraded relationship again and getting someone back to work in that instance almost never is successful. So in terms of managing perceptions, if we keep the communication early, we keep talking to the person about, you know, getting educated on their injury. And we can get educated on their injury as well. We can sort of find out what's going on for this individual, what the expectations are for this individual, um, track them, not put too much pressure on them just because the doctor does say that they should be better in six weeks. Again, it's a should, you know, so they may not be better in six weeks. And if they're not better, it doesn't necessarily mean that they did something wrong. It just may mean that their recovery is different from the last person who had that condition. So keeping your perceptions in check as well, as far as the employer goes, is quite important to managing these. Okay. So what we do know is that employers who maintain communication with injured workers and look to understand their perceptions about return to work achieve better outcomes for all. Okay. So they achieve better outcomes in terms of a quicker return to work, usually within that three month period, if reasonable. Um, and that means that they achieve better outcomes in terms of the cost to the organization. In terms of how to manage perceptions, we want to maintain that open communication from time of injury, regardless of claim status. I've seen employers wait to see if a claim's going to get up before they actually contact a worker, and that's no good to anyone. We don't want the claim, basically, that's the thing. So if we maintain the communication regardless of what's going to happen and we get the worker back to work, then if it does become a claim, that period's gonna be shorter because they're gonna be back at work, they're gonna be recovering in a healthy environment, in a satisfying job, a meaningful job. They're gonna be recovering around their usual day-to-day -day relationships and they're gonna be less likely to have a negative experience that amplifies their symptoms. The other thing is around acknowledging individual factors. So again, this comes down to every case is different. Okay, so yes, we have a broad scope of generally with a certain type of injury, they should have a certain type of recovery, but it doesn't always go that way. So we need to acknowledge what's different for that individual that may impact on their recovery. Um, do they have an okay relationship with their supervisor and their colleagues or has there been other things going on in the workplace that may make them not want to come back to work and how do we manage that? Have they had um, a good family life? Do they have a good family life? Because sometimes when people have a um, perhaps a relationship breakdown or a marriage breakdown right around the time that they have their injury that can also impact on them coming back to work. So how much do we know about that? And is there a way we can use work to support them through that process, um, knowing that work can be a healthy social outlet for someone and also a healthy distraction for someone. Work to identify solutions or provide support. So the most important thing in terms of maintaining that communication with the worker is that we also remain solution focused not getting drawn into perhaps negative perceptions or those catastrophizing behaviors, but looking at, okay, I understand how you're feeling and I understand what's going on, but what can we do 
to help? What can we do to get you through this? Do we need to find out more information from your doctor? Do we need to look at other duties? So being solution focused and working with the worker to identify those. Involve the worker. One of the other things, and I'm probably a bit biased on this one, being a rehab provider myself, <laughs> but I would say where you're not sure of how to manage a worker, use a rehab provider. That's what rehabilitation providers are for, is to help identify what are the injured worker's needs? How are they perceiving their injury right now? You know, what are their feelings around their injury? It's about managing the barriers to return to work, so both for the individual and if your managers or your supervisors aren't sure, providing that education around what the worker is going through and their specific condition. It can be to communicate with treatment providers, to actually find out some of that information, particularly where the worker is unsure about why they're not recovering as quickly as possible, or you as the employer are unsure about why they can't upgrade their duties. It's about communicating with the treatment provider to find out what the reasons might be. Can also be to help in identifying suitable duties. As we said, you may have a comprehensive sort of dictionary of suitable duties that you can give to an individual when they're injured, but they may not quite fit a certain person's um, injury or their restrictions. So you might need sort of that third party to come in and look at them and be a bit creative about what might be the options here. And obviously a rehabilitation provider can do that. And as I said, can provide education and guidance. It's important to note that a rehabilitation provider should not advocate for the injured worker. You know, and that's something that I feel very strongly about being a psychologist because I know that a lot of psychologists will advocate for the injured worker, but a rehab provider is there to be a support both to the employer and the worker to help both parties through the injury and to get the best outcomes for both parties. So it's not about one or the other, it's about how do we work best to satisfy everyone in a situation that is very difficult and can be a negative experience for all. Okay. So I have just a few takeaway messages. I think I've probably breezed straight through all of my slides there. I have a tendency to do that. Um, so as we said, we know that time off work following injury impacts both the individual and the organisation and that that chance of returning to work decreases as time off work increases. We want to manage those worker perceptions because their perceptions of the injury, the relationship with the employer, the capacity to return to work influences how long they stay off of work. And then we know that those longer time off works impact on overall claim costs, potential recruitment, potential um, retraining costs. You know, so there's an impact for everyone in terms of that time off work. In terms of preparing for someone to come back to work and minimising the time off work, the sooner we get in, the better. So the sooner we maintain communication with the worker, we understand what's going on for them, we work to identify solutions as far as return to work goes, so suitable duties, the quicker we can get back, get the worker back to work and the more positive we can make that experience for everyone, not just the individual but the organisation as well.